everybody. Welcome to the latest version of TRD Talks. My name is Erin Hudson. I'm a reporter with The Real Deal. And today we have an exciting lineup where we're going to be talking to the top residential brokers in New York City. Um, John Gomes, one of the founders of the Eckling Gomes team at Douglas Elliman. Lisa Lippman from Brown Hair Stevens. And Leonard Steinberg, chief evangelist at Compass and also a broker, of course. <clears throat> and before we get started, uh, our talk is made possible by Citizens Bank. Um, so I just want to give Citizens uh, Ace Watatana Supar a chance to speak a little bit before we get started. Erin, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, my last name is always a tongue twister. So definitely kept, it, kept you on your toes, Erin. But um, this is definitely a new normal. And I'm so excited to be sponsoring this session just because you guys are in for such a great treat with John Gomes, Leonard, Lisa. They're going to share their best practices. And I think it's a time for us to all really just take a step back, you know, really value what's most important. And with this extra time, it, it allows us to be creative and really go back to the roots of what we actually do, right, which is really connecting with our borrowers and clients. So uh, without further ado, just so glad to be sponsoring this session. And I'm so excited to hear uh, my friends talk about their best practices. So take it away, Erin. Thanks so much, Ace, and being for, so gracious. Um, I also just want to say, though, that not everybody, though not everybody can be a sponsor, um, another way to support the real deal and help us bring you the news that's so important at this critical time is to become a subscriber. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Um, so... John, Lisa, and Leonard, I wanted to ask you just how you're all doing um, and how does this compare with other moments of duress in your careers? Lisa, ladies wow. and um, Well, I, I'm doing well and I feel blessed that me and my immediate family are doing well. Um, I don't take it for granted at all. Um, so I feel lucky about that. Um, in terms of how it compares to my career, I've been doing this for 23 years. So I worked through 9-11. I worked through the 2008-2009 financial crisis. I would say to me, it feels more similar to 9-11, just in the sense of the fact that people are dying. And there's a lot of sadness that's beyond um, the fact that the economy is going to suffer and people are losing their jobs. There's a sense of sadness. There's a sense of um, uh, turning within, soul searching, looking at the way we do things, knowing that the world's never going to be the same in many ways. Um, and so I find myself thinking about that a lot. I <clears throat> tend to be a positive person most of the time. And so I'm trying to find the silver lining in all of this. I've got three children. Uh, they age. They range in age from 14 to 25, and I also have to be an example to them. I have two of them here with me in my house for the last few weeks, and I'm trying to think about how we're going to move forward afterwards and what we're going to take away from this. Absolutely. Leonard, what about you? Well, I think first and foremost, what's most on my mind is the suffering and the pain that so many are experiencing right now. I think we're all three very fortunate in that we are in these, you know, homes removed from the center of this tragedy. And it is a, a world-class, almost biblically uh, scaled tragedy that we shouldn't underestimate or belittle in any way. So as much as I'm trying to be positive and put on a very, you know, optimistic spin to all of this, there is nothing that can be said or done at this point to belittle in any way the anguish that some people are experiencing right now, and it's a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people have been impacted by this. We talk about the death rate, but we should also remember the volume of people who are suffering with a really, really bad virus, and then all the family members and friends and support <clears throat> around that, not to mention our extraordinary um, first responders and medical teams who are doing exceptional work. So that is foremost on my mind, and then, of course, you cannot drown in that because it's easy to drown in that. And you just have to really work on your mental, emotional, and physical well-being at this time, too. So I think there are many mixed emotions that I'm feeling. 
but I'm trying mm. my best to maintain composure. And I also feel a responsibility to my colleagues, uh, you know, at Compass and in the brokerage community in general to give some sense of hope and optimism throughout all of this, because there is always a beginning and a middle uh, and an end to uh, an event like this. Right. And, and John, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Um, I feel very fortunate to be removed here in, you know, Litchfield County, where I have a country home. Uh, I'm here with my husband and my two children. And um, for me, I really think the whole experience, quite frankly, is surreal. Uh, just earlier this afternoon, I found myself stepping away from a series of Zoom calls that I had. And I thought about it for a moment. I thought, I'm really here in Connecticut. And it's another Monday. And I'm going back to work again in this way. And I sort of removed myself from everything and sort of looked at it from a more g global perspective. And I almost sometimes can't believe that it's real. And that's what I mean about the surrealness of it, because I feel like I've gotten so accustomed to the new abnormal, as I call it. Uh, yet at the same time, it's becoming quite normal in a way. So it's, it's surreal, really, truly. Now, for me, professionally, um, I got into the business just after 9-11, so I didn't have that experience. I did go through 2008, um, and, you know, that was very trying. I was also at a different point in my career. Uh, Frederick and I were just starting at that time, and, you know, we didn't have the responsibility of a team of a, almost 100 team members in, you know, four different cities across the, uh, the country. So I feel a sense of responsibility and the duty uh, to them that I didn't feel the first time. Right. Well, speaking of just kind of getting into the new normal, um, you know, about two weeks ago, the state declared residential services non-essential um, and the work specifically of agents and brokers. And then last week, there was a slight modification to that, which now deems, you know, allows brokers to go into homes to film a tour. And, you know, I'm curious how you're adapting to the new normal in the sense of continuing your work, um, continuing to do deals. Um, but I do also want to ask you about this sort of change that came through last week. And, you know, as you've adapted to your new normal, are you suddenly going to readapt now that you could go to a property? Um, does that change anything for you? And how do you feel about it? Can I jump in? Okay. Yeah, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, Lisa. Um, you know, what I would say is, first and foremost, mm -hmm. um, you know, the state's a big place, and um, people show homes and sell properties in many different ways in different parts of the state. So I am very conscious of the message that to me is the most important, is that for the next few weeks, until we flatten the curve, we need to not see other people and not go to places that are not our own home um, and see as few and interface with as few people as possible. So that's something that I'm really thinking about. And while the directive was changed, things are different in New York City than they are in a suburban place. You know, these are not just a house. I mean, we do have townhouses, obviously, but most of the properties we show are part of a larger building. And I'm also conscious of respecting the um, the rights and the wishes of the co-ops and the condos in which we work. So um, I, I have not participated in virtual tours because I'm sort of listening to the overriding rule that you're supposed to be staying at home and the business is not as usual and I'm not a healthcare worker and I don't work in a grocery store and I don't work in pharmacy and I don't really think that it's right for me to start going into home, into people's buildings, into their elevators, passing their doormen. Um, it's, not, it's not fair um, and I have not started doing that yet and I won't do that until we are told that we can start working again. Um, I know later on you're going to ask us about virtual tours anyway and there's another reason why I don't think it's worth doing. Yeah but I'll yeah. get to that later. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Leonard, I know you have long expressed your, your opinion on this subject, but um, I'm curious, you know, how, how you responded, especially knowing that some trade organizations had sort of been trying to get a slight relaxation of the, the strict stay at home. Well, I think most importantly, mine is not an opinion. Mine is a, a wording based on fact and data. And we in this coronavirus have an extraordinary head start 
on how to deal with this based on precedent that we've seen in China, South Korea, Japan, and a whole host of other places around the world to know what works. And I think we have, a, I really do believe we have a moral obligation towards our fellow citizens to minimize any kind of exposure to this virus as we possibly can. We have so little that we can do that this is one thing we really can do. And I think it is an obligation of all of us to commit to this however difficult it may be. I would agree with Lisa though that it is different in certain parts of the state where maybe you drive up to a house, unlock a door, hose it, you know, wash it down with alcohol and then someone were to walk through that house. But even then I would say extreme caution has to be um, taken because it's always health first. We have to remind ourselves, we are in the midst of a raging fire. And anyone who goes into a fire and says, let's um, build a house over there is insane. So I do hear some insanity that's permeating in our industry. And I think that has to be tempered with a new sense of patience and calm, rational thinking that is based on science and data. And that is telling us very loudly and clearly to limit any exposure to other human beings. It works. We can see it already beginning to work here. We see it working in Europe, and we've seen it work tremendously effectively in the Far East, where they've been able to contain this virus at a spectacularly uh, impressive um, rate, which is something I think we're gonna learn from in the future. Well, I, I do want to, sorry, John, to jump in first, but I, I want to get a little bit into the financial aspect of what this means and I want to understand kind of how many how, how much business you're still being able to do now um, and how that looks but also you know what do you think the impact of a period of non-working could be on maybe some of your lesser experienced colleagues um, people who maybe don't have the same pipelines that some of you do um, John do you want to start off yeah, absolutely. Look, I really do feel for a lot of our less experienced colleagues who didn't have a lot of deals that were sort of working in the pipeline and, you know, might not have as much money saved up. I really do truly feel for them. And I'm thrilled that the government is allowing them to actually be part of this pool to receive uh, unemployment, because I think that's very important and well deserved. Um, that that being said, I mean, I think, and going back to what Leonard and Lisa said, we've got to practice this safety first. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we really have to, uh, as everyone keeps saying, flatten this curve, truly. Uh, it, it, it's, it is our duty and it is our social responsibility. That being said, of course, there are economic consequences that will come as a result. But at the same time, we're not alone in that. The entire world is alone, is not, rather, is, is in the same boat as us, quite frankly. And by the way, it's only gonna be worse for all of us if we don't take these necessary precautions now. That's the point of all of us being isolated in our homes. I remember 9-11 very well, by the way. In September of 2000, that's how old I am. Um, I don't remember much, but I remember that. September 2001, the real estate market died. It was dead. October was virtually dead as well. November, you saw some signs of life. And in December, you saw green shoots. Then in January of 2002, you saw an explosion of activity. Sometimes patience is rewarded. And I always tell agents, especially now who are so obsessed by figures and numbers and monthly reports and, you know, broker of the week, broker of the hour, broker of the minute, broker of the month. I think that obsession with this uh, hour to hour monitoring of sales is, of course, very important to people who are in a mode of survival. That's different. But I do think a real estate career and any kind of numbers are best assessed in real estate brokerage at the end of the year. And it may just be that December 31st rolls around at the end of 2020 and we look back and we go, oh, it wasn't nearly as bad as we thought it could have been because you can play tremendous catch up later. Real estate is a catch up industry. It's unlike a cup of coffee. I'm not gonna go back to my local coffee shop on May 1st and order 50 cups of coffee, but I will potentially more than likely go and buy the apartment that I've been holding off on buying. So I think we're actually in a fortunate industry in that um, the structure by which we um, exist for buying and selling remains the same. I think there are many variables and I think it's gonna vary very, very much based on job losses and how much people have lost in the equity markets. But let's face it, the Dow has rebounded already 24% up from its lows. 
in that is recovery and in that is also money making. So they're going to be all these multiple little pockets that have a vast variety of scenarios. And until it plays itself out, we have no idea where it's um, going to land. Do you think, though, that some of your colleagues, I mean, the part of the stimulus package that could benefit brokers is that brokers could now apply for unemployment um, in a way that as an independent contractor, they couldn't before. Do you think that, you know, the industry is going to take advantage of that? And do you think that that will be put in use? I I can't imagine why people wouldn't do that. I mean, why wouldn't they? Right? Mm -hmm. I I think it's tough to say that people are going to take advantage of it. Um, I think, you know, there's a, a false narrative that real estate brokers don't work as hard as other people do and that it's big money and it's easy money. Um, you know, most real estate brokers don't make big money and they work hard. Um, and a lot of them have been doing it for a very long time, working very hard, working very solidly and making a living, but never a huge living. And there's no reason that, you know, people like that or anybody else who's been working hard at something shouldn't be entitled to benefits. Um, so, you know, to say that someone's going to take advantage of it is, is that's a tough call. Um, I, I wouldn't say that people are going to take advantage of it. I think that, you know, if you can show that you've been working in something for a period of time and, um, that you have earned money in the past and now you're not going to be able to earn money, um, you know, that's valid. That's how it works in any other industry in which you apply for unemployment. I just, I wanted to add into something that Leonard said too, which I think when I teach new brokers, one of the things that I teach them about being successful long-term is what Leonard's talking about. You can't think about what you're doing every week and you can't be so focused on making money this second. You have to be focused on the long-term and making relationships. And I, I agree with Leonard 100% and I keep telling my sellers this and buyers and anybody who seems really upset that, you know, after 9-11, we bounced back. Mm -hmm. Um, You can't rush these things. They have to come back when people are ready. And that means we'll come back when, when the curve is flattened and when people can go outside again and people feel confident to be with other people and to be out and about. I just want to clarify when I said take advantage of it, I didn't mean take advantage of it in a negative way. I meant here is government assistance for the brokerage community that is absolutely something our community is entitled to. If you were to look at the amount of tax dollars agents generate, even those who are earning $50,000 and less, they are entitled to the same form of um, support that the government provides all other Americans. Agreed. And I think it's a wonderful thing that Correct. I agree. doing this. I, I also think there's a horrible false narrative that all agents are making millions of dollars. I think that is a, a fallacy, a fantasy, and it is important right now for the general uh, community to understand that. Do you think that we're going to see a lot of the younger brokers have to sort of leave the business or really be kind of in a bind here? I mean... I don't know if you could share any stories that you may have encountered of younger peers, but um, you know, I was talking to a rental broker just as this all began, who was sort of speaking about just for peers and colleagues, you know, credit card debt is at all time highs and just, you know, how, how for something that you don't know when it will end, how they may sustain themselves. I think this pandemic is really going to cause all of us to take a look at what we are doing and how it's going to be done differently. Some people are simply not going to be able to survive this. It's just the reality of the situation. And they're just going to have to look at themselves introspectively and say, is this really what I want to go back to? Or maybe I should... I've had a lifelong dream of becoming a writer and maybe I should focus my efforts on that. Or maybe I I love cooking so much or I'm a florist and I really want to, you know, there are many other things that brokers ourselves are always doing and lots of hobbies that keep us, you know, interested. Uh, And I think that people might be thinking about other options. They might just, you know, they may just give up, particularly people who have not seen a great deal of success or have not had the windfall of, you know, money that they were looking to achieve in the industry. I think that, yes, there will be some people that fall off. It's just, it, it happens every time we go through a crisis. We've seen it time and time again. I also think we should remember that it's not just young brokers. Uh, real estate brokerage actually uh, draws in age groups across the spectrum 
starting a first, second, third or fourth career, sometimes even a semi-retirement career where real estate really affords people in their 50s, 60s and 70s the opportunity to have a fully fledged career. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be uh, across the board, not just age group, but across the board, those who don't have very well established businesses that may be impacted by this. But I think you may be surprised. I think in all markets, in all environments, there are tremendous opportunities. I do think this is a moment where the consumer will gravitate more towards those with bigger, ex greater experience. So I think experience will have great value right now. I wanted to add something that I think may be something that people haven't thought about. Um, I've spent a lot more time sort of obviously just talking to colleagues. You know, usually I would talk to colleagues about the deals we're working on. Now it tends to be sort of more esoterical conversations. And um, one of the things that I've heard from colleagues of mine who have been doing this for a long time and have done it really successfully and continue to work because they want to, maybe not necessarily because they have to work this much, is whether they ever want to go back to working as hard as they did before. I've had a bunch of conversations with people who talk about how they realize how they can do so much more than they thought virtually and that they're really enjoying the time with their loved ones, reading, exercising, spending time in nature, and that maybe they don't want to go back to the rat race as much. Again, these are people who've been doing it for a long time, working very hard. You know, like I've been doing this for 23 years, which is a pretty long time in the industry. There's a lot of friends I have who've been doing it for 30, 35, 40 years. And I'm, I'm going to, it'll be curious to see if we all go back as hard as we did before. I am so not ready for retirement. I can't. <laughs> if this is for retirement, I'm, this, I'll never retire. Never. <laughs> I don't think I will either, but I'm just telling you what people have said. <laughs> I actually think that this, look, as this, uh, this is a bad situation that we're in. However, I have to say that I'm looking at this as a real opportunity to learn and grow from this experience. Because I remember the last time it was 2008 and Frederick and I were just sort of getting our business up and going. And for the first time we hit the real deal list that year, which was a big deal for us because it was a big goal for a long time. Um, and now here, you know, at that time, um, we, we, the market crashed. And then we thought, what can we do? We, we want to go to work every day because we don't want to give up because everyone else was just giving up and going to the beach. So we thought about how the market was going to change and how it was going to be different when the market came back. And we had all these different ideas that we were experimenting with. One of them, which was a pilot that we created for a television show. And look at the impact that television has had on our business since then. I look at this in the same way. And Frederick and I, with the team, keep saying to everyone, you've got to look at this as an opportunity. Look at what's changing under our feet. Think about the other side of this pandemic and what our industry is going to look like. And if you can figure that out, then you're going to be at an advantage uh, compared to others. And that could get, you know, you could take off from there. And quite frankly, I will say it was in 2008 when the industry did change and some people, a lot of people did fall off. It gave us a path and an opportunity to sort of make our way. So I think many people will have an opportunity to make their way from here. So I, I want to kind of seize on the learning for a second and talk about virtual showings, which we sort of touched on earlier. And just how, you know, how are you learning to do your business remotely, virtually? And um, do you believe in virtual showings? That's a Lisa question. Lisa? Or do you, take it away? Um, well, you know, really how I'm going to answer that is uh, I don't really think, I think you can do a virtual showing. I Generally, I think that the photos and the floor plans that we have online these days, I know Brown Harris Stevens has a beautiful website, as do my, my competitors on this uh, in this interview. Um, I'm not sure how much better you can do um, at showing a property without somebody walking through it um, virtually. I'm not convinced that, that that makes a really big difference. I'm also not convinced that people are going to buy something based on a virtual tour. Um, I think when they would do that would be when they see the price as so low that it's so appealing, they're willing to do it. And I personally am not going to instruct any of my sellers to sell something so low, feeling so desperate um, at this moment, because I think that things will come back. And um, 
I, I just don't see virtual tours as something, you know, if you're selling a cookie cutter one bedroom apartment in a high rise condominium where they all look the same and the buyer has seen other ones and one comes on the market and it's really well priced, you may make a deal like that. But most of the unique properties that we show are not things that are going to be sold well. And when I mean well, well for everybody, well for the seller, well for our real estate market, well for the co-ops boards, the condos boards. Um, we're not going to make these deals based on virtual showings. I just, you know, New York real estate's too interesting, too unique, um, and too expensive, frankly. Well, Lisa, uh, push back a little because the, the new development selling off floor plans and, you know, that hasn't been happening for a while, but in theory, it, it can be done. So I guess, you know, do you think that not having a sales gallery is a huge huge detriment to that? Well, again, I mean, it, it's an interesting question and you're right. People do buy things based on virtual tours and based off floor plans. Generally, they buy things like that in two scenarios. One in a go-go market where they feel that if they don't buy now, they will miss out and not get something later. Or if they think they're getting a really good deal on something. And I don't think we're in either situation right now. I don't think anybody feels we're in a go-go market and they've got to grab something before somebody else buys it. I wish, I wish we did feel that way, but I don't think buyers do. And I don't think that we're going to see sellers letting things go in the next month or two, however much longer this is going to be at really low prices. I just don't think we're going to see that happening. There will be some deals that get done, but I don't think it's going to become the norm at all. Yeah. John Leonard, what do you, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think that ev for some reason, everyone seems to focus on this aspect of the virtual tour as a, will you make a deal or not make a deal? For me, I look at it differently. While I agree with you, Lisa, where I do not think that we're going to sell apartments just virtually, I don't think that that's going to happen. However, I think that we can all agree that the showings that we've done to lead to a signed contract more recently have had like three, four, and five mm -hmm. showings where a buyer comes back multiple times. <laughs> I think that this virtual showing is maybe the first step. And I really think, and I'm going to make a bold prediction here, this word virtual that we keep talking about is going to be a major part of our industry moving forward. That I know. It, we're scratching the surface with these videos that we're trying to sort of put together at the last minute, and some people don't want to do it. Um, we are literally scratching the surface. I truly believe when we come out of this pandemic, we are going to be doing a lot of digital virtual types of showings. I don't think that that's going to be the only thing we're going to be doing, but I think it's going to be yet another tool that agents will have to use to sell their properties. Absolutely. So I think the virtual showing quality right now still stinks. I think it's just not that sort of quality that would, uh, persuade someone to buy an expensive property, which is really what we're dealing with in New York City. This is very expensive real estate at pretty much every price level. I do, however, think that when you have a large home with grounds, the visuals you can create are so stimulating and exciting that you really could potentially sell that way. But I think the quality right now for an apartment is so restrictive. And frankly, these uh, goggle style virtual showings, I think are horrific. They make me nauseous. They make me want to throw up at times. And I don't see people buying that way. I equate um, these virtual showings sometime as asking if someone would go for a date from meeting someone on online or would they get married? So I think you have to look at it from that perspective. Maybe you'd go out on a date. You'd want to explore a little bit more. And I do think it is one element of marketing, but I don't think it is the element of marketing. Just to go back on John's point about television, I think television has helped the consumer's eye get trained to looking at things in a televised video format. I do, however, think the shows, at least some of them, have broadcast a perception of agents that's horrific and been unbelievably damaging, especially to newer agents, because the perception of an agent being able to earn quick, easy money the way some of these shows um, portray agents has been horrible. It's been really horrible. And worse than that, it's also it's false and fake. So I think that is going to shift in the future because I think the consumer deserves better to know what agents really experience rather than this fantasy of, you know, signing contracts from helicopters while, you know, smoking a cigar. 
I have to disagree with Leonard on that one. I have to, I've got to respond to that. I've got to disagree with you on that one, Leonard, because, you know, I, I cannot get over the number of inquiries that we receive from college students. And I mean, in some cases, students graduating from Ivy League schools who are writing to Frederick because they're inspired by what he has done and what they see him do on television. So I think while you may think that it's tacky and all those things that you described, there are a lot of people who are exposed to our industry in a way that they have never otherwise had the opportunity before. And I think that that is a positive thing. And we've met many of these people and they actually, we've interviewed them and some people have actually taken, you know, work with us. So, that, but you have, uh, to, you have to admit, John, that the shtick that comes across on some of these shows is so horrifically falsified and it doesn't portray reality. And that, uh, you know, unrealistic perception gives the consumer an understanding of what an agent's role in society is that really isn't true. So, but that, it's reality TV, but it's reality TV and not reality, documentary it's style. It's, but it's, it's, and TV is meant to be entertaining. And by the way, look at the way that it showcases some of these properties. You have to agree, some of these homes look really spectacular. Like you just described, these big, beautiful homes to show the grounds and with these great cameras and these angles and these experienced teams of people who, by the way, work really hard at what they do. And I think that it's a positive thing for the industry. I, I, I really do, but from my, from my perspective, it's different, I guess, because my business has exploded since Frederick has been on the television show. So I look at it differently than you do. Well, I think it's been very good for, the, uh, for you as an agent and for you as Frederick as an agent, but I think for the agent community, it has been terribly damaging, terribly Let damaging. I do want to ask you one question, though, because I know Kristen Jordan at Compass is now going to be on the show, and I'm just curious, you know, how you see that fitting in. Well, I hope she just doesn't throw drinks at people. That's what I care about. I think portraying the life of an agent on television is wonderful, but portraying this fake fantasy, I know it's necessary for ratings and for television producers to feel that that produces some kind of um, visual message to the world that's entertaining. And I understand it's, it's very cheap content for the networks. And I do think if she portrays herself in a manner that's dignified and shows the role of a professional in all of this, then I'm 100% for it. And I do think there have been agents in television shows who've done that, but throwing drinks and fake drama and all that other stuff just makes us all look bad. It does give you brand name recognition as the agent in the show, but what it does for the profession is horrible. Well, okay, let's, let's leave that question. Let's move on. <laughs> ask, I wanna pose a question to Lisa. Um, because I was on the phone with someone today who will remain nameless, who just said, who are these lunatics who are buying real estate at this point? And I'm curious, who are the buyers? Who's out there who wants to buy a condo, a co-op, a townhouse, whatever it is? Um, I think the people who want to buy real estate are the people who always want to buy real estate. Um, I, you know, I don't think that people looking for, I don't think opportunists may be out there right now. Um, I think serious people are out there. So, you know, the same people who want to buy are, you know, I'm talking to my buyers and my sellers almost every day. So I've got buyers who are moving because they need more space. I have buyers because who are um, buying because they want less space. Buyers who are changing neighborhoods. Lots of buyers who have been in rentals for a long time and finally want to buy something. Take advantage of the lower interest rate. Take advantage of the fact that the market's not so frothy anymore to be a buyer. Um, all those people are going to continue to buy. They're all on pause right now because we can't go into the properties. And you know what John said is true. No one looks at an apartment one time anymore. People go back three, four, five times. Um, so I have a bunch of buyers who are sort of in the middle of the process. I don't think that um, they're going to consummate a deal in the, during this time. And truthfully, I, I wouldn't suggest to them that they should unless there was some competition for the property and they were really sure that they were ready to jump on one particular one and sign a contract. But we have all the same people buying. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to say it too many times, but, you know, 9-11 was a direct onslaught on New York City. It was a direct onslaught on big cities. Um, it was a direct onslaught on the United States of America. 
And people thought afterwards that nobody would want to live in New York anymore. And everybody said that the public, the private schools would have big vacancies by the following fall. And what Leonard said is true. The first month or so after 9-11, we all had buyers walk away from deposits. People say, I'll never live in New York. I'm moving you know, far away, whatever. That was very few people, really. By January, things were really busy. There was a great sense of patriotism um, coming together. People felt really good about New York City. And I think that the same thing is true now. You know, my, most of my friends who are not in the city right now because they're lucky to have a second home, what do they keep saying? I can't wait to come back to New York. I can't wait to go back to crowded restaurants. I can't wait to wait in line at the theater or at the movies and be on a crowded subway. You know, none of us live in New York because it's easy. We live in New York because we love it. We love the energy. We love the culture. We love the diversity. We love the beauty. We love the architecture. We love being shoulder to shoulder with other people. And those people are going to continue to buy in New York. Erin, I would also just like to add that this moment, as tragic as it is, and it is a tragic moment, this moment is probably the first trillion dollar public relations event to broadcast the meaning and the value of having a home. I, I really, that. really believe that everyone right now, if they're in a beautiful home right now, values that home more than anything else. And I know of a lot of people who put off buying their home who are in circumstances right now that they shouldn't be in. And they really regret the fact that they put their lives on hold for what? So well, this is to have... a public relations event of epic proportions for home ownership. I've definitely heard that sentiment come up a lot, um, admittedly a lot from brokers and developers. So, but I think the, the question is who are real buyers? Like I've heard a little bit that anyone with a 1031 exchange where they may need to buy would be someone who is a real buyer who isn't just gonna get to wait until this crisis resolves itself. So- Erin, oh, there, there, are, there are real buyers that are out yeah. there and I'll tell you because I, I sent an email out to my team um, this morning asking who's, because I know that there, there have been a number of deals in the past couple of weeks. And I asked them, can you give me a short little blurb on you know, what deal you did and what, what the circumstances were? And generally speaking, in most of the cases, it's people that were looking before that had been there multiple times that were considering. But I say they're smart buyers. They're people who are- looking to take advantage of an opportunity. It's like Lisa said, and by the way, Lisa, I love you so much for what you said. You excited me to go back to New York City. You can't even believe. Uh, New York is such a resilient place and it's always gonna be a value. So people realize that if you're smart enough and you were looking anyway, you wanted to buy something, well, guess what? The, the deals in every case, every one of the cases with my brokers, they all said they went back and they renegotiated they got it for a lower price or they were maybe didn't put it in offer before, but they were talking to the broker and they didn't think that they could get it at X price with the circumstances. They've gone back and they said, you know what? We're more flexible. Those are the deals that are happening. Those are the people who are buying people who are taking advantage of the opportunity. They're smart. The best One thing I want to add to, sorry, Erin, the best purchase I ever made was in October of 2001. The best purchase in real estate I've ever made in my entire lifetime was that. Uh, we have, so Lisa, hold on one second. I just want to ask a question to get the next round of discussion going. Um, so someone, we have sort of two questions. One, how are you kind of keeping boots on the ground when you physically have to be wherever you are right now in your home, where you can't go out, you can't meet with someone? How are you kind of maintaining a physical presence in some way? And two part question, how are you handling marketing at this time, considering the sensitivity of these times? Um, you know, I think I'm sure everyone has got an email that felt a little tone deaf. Um, how are you trying to be mindful of that? This is not a time for boots on the ground. This is a time for boots at home. Okay. <laughs> this is a time for boots at home. And I think that I personally am holding back on all marketing efforts right now, other than just keeping the listings we have active exposed to the world. But I've seen some really tacky stuff out there. You know, wouldn't you love to live here and be quarantined in this living room? Hmm. Are you kidding me? It's just so tacky. This is not a time to be tacky. This is people who send out messaging like that right now are akin to the agents who hand out business cards at funerals. 
It's disgusting. So right now is the time for, it's for me personally for restraint and maintaining that which is available, visible to the outside world. Because I think a lot of people have a lot of time right now to actually look at real estate online. Well, which is why I think- I think it's not necessarily uh, following that through. But Lisa, what, what were you gonna do? So what I've done is I've started creating um, videos for all of my properties without going back into the properties. I'm taking the photographs and I'm, I'm putting them to music. I'm making them a little bit more interesting so that if people are searching the web, they come up with something that's a little more interesting. Um, I'm keeping my sellers up to date about that. Um, and beyond that, I'm, I'm sending notes to my buyers and my sellers, just checking in on them, seeing how they're doing. Um, again, really, you know, I, I like to say that 98% of the people that I work with, I actually really like spending time with. And so I'm making sure that they know that I, I am, I care about them and I'm checking in on them. And I have to tell you, it goes back a little bit to the last question. I can't tell you how many buyers have said to me, we can't wait to see you again. Like we need to start looking. We're so crowded in our apartment. Um, so I think it's, it's true. Like you don't hand out your cards. People come to you when they want you, they know how to find you. You just want to make, people want to know that you're thinking about them and that you care about them. So one way you can take care of a property you're marketing is just keeping the website fresh and maybe thinking of ways that you can do something to it from afar. While I agree with, sorry, I just wanna say, while, while I agree with Leonard that I think it is quite tacky when you attach COVID-19 or quarantine, uh, pandemic, those words to any marketing, I, I just think that that's really tacky and I've seen those. I will say though, I represent many developers and I recently sent out an e-blast that was a, a visual tour of maybe 10 different projects that we represent. And it was, it didn't mention anything about the pandemic. I don't think that it's sexy or like cool uh, to attach yourself to that. I think it's a negative thing, but I do have a producer responsibility and we are in business and we are, you know, we do have an economic consideration here and our developers certainly do have their economic situation as well. So I think it's important that we generally gently remind people while they are home and they do have more time and they are searching online and looking at lots of things, including real estate websites it's, and our emails. I think it's okay to gently remind people. I think it's tacky when you go that direction that he was referring to. We have an audience question that's just asking, um, do you think there's going to be more of a split between luxury and affordable and the middle of the market is going to drop off? So you're going to have low end buyers still there for kind of your starter, starter New York homes. And then you're going to have the ultra luxury. Anything in the middle is going to disappear. I'm curious what you think about that. I think you can I'll answer that. Go ahead. Um, I don't think so. I think like, like always, not surprisingly, the ultra luxury is going to feel the economic downturn the least, right? If you have, you know, more than $10 million to spend on a property, hopefully um, you have it in many, many different places. And even if your stock portfolio is down, it's, it's still above 2016 levels. So that's still pretty high. Um, and those people aren't people who lose their jobs. So I think for sure that'll stay. Um, the low end will continue to be there only because it's often less expensive to buy than to rent, um, especially with low interest rates. But I think that the middle, we're going to see a mixture of my answer to both of those things. Um, will you see people who were stretching um, based on a salary um, and very little down? Will you see that less? You may see that less. Um, and that, that may be okay, by the way. You know, that's not really a great thing. And one of the real, re, reasons that our real estate market never suffered so much is that people do put more down here than they do in other places, especially, you know, because of co-ops and just the way things work. Um, but I don't think that the middle is going to go away. I mean, you know, it's a little bit hard to say what the middle is because um, New York's middle is very different. You know, if, if I were to tell you that the middle is three to $5 million and anybody from outside of our sweet little island watches the show, you know, they'll think it's preposterous. So um, maybe I should also ask you what you think of what the middle is. Yeah. Well, I, okay, I'm gonna deflect the question, sorry. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard to say. But I am gonna say that there was this huge r rise in 
non-cash buyers, so people taking mortgages out to buy their homes. And I'm curious, especially in this age where there's so much unemployment, a lot of people are losing their jobs, um, if, especially maybe on the lower end, there's going to be sort of a rise in distressed properties in New York City and how that may or may not sort of feed into your business or feed into business in general for, for the industry. I think the answer to that is unknown at this time, because until you have a real timeline for the trajectory of this virus, you really cannot fully grasp the extent of the economic impact. And only once you have a full grasp of the economic impact can you really determine what kind of jobs will be lost, and if they are just at the you know, entry level, or if they're going to be executive level jobs as well. Because really, at the end of the day, anyone buying a middle of the road apartment in New York is earning a small fortune on world standards, even on American standards. So I always uh, call New York the middle rich. You have the middle rich who are buying between like two and four million dollars, which sounds ridiculous outside of New York, but that's really middle class in New York standards, which is ridiculous and pathetic, but it is what it is. I do, however, believe that um, a lot of the jobs that were lost immediately, which is a big chunk of jobs, are mostly people who don't buy three and four million dollar apartments. And until you have a timeline for this virus, you have no idea how this is going to play out yet. It is possible that within a few weeks we might have a system of mass testing, maybe even a treatment that prevents hospitalization that could change everything quite dynamically. But I think it's a little too early to know what, what it'll be. I believe, however, that the first group of buyers that will emerge are people looking for bargains. And I think there's the 30% of buyer who's out already actively bidding. And then there's going to be the next group, which I think, I hate to say this, but I think after living together in a home for four weeks or eight weeks, or however long this may be, you may have a lot of divorce buyers. But I'm kidding. I think the, uh, the other group Not is the joke. essential buyer. They need a home, they need to buy, they need to sell, they need to, they're getting divorced, they're getting married. They made a fortune, they lost a fortune. Life goes on after tragic events, always. Well, on, on the note of the bargains, I want to direct a question to John now. Um, for, I mean, especially in new development, I'm curious if you're seeing any uptick in investor activity in particular, um, people who maybe think that we are nearing the bottom, if not the bottom. Are you, are you encountering that sentiment at all? Yes, absolutely. So we, before the pandemic, were already seeing an uptick in investor buying. I'm getting lots of people who are coming to me saying, I have a buyer or I have a group of buyers that's looking to buy multiple units within new developments because they do know that there is a lot of inventory and you know some developers are not you know having the success that others are and people are out there looking for opportunities. Absolutely, I've presented many, many opportunities such as this and that was happening before the pandemic. So I can only assume that this trend is going to continue and move forward. What I can also assume is that the prices that those people are willing to pay is going to get lower. The question, of course, is how much lower is it going to get? I would say very encouraging, Erin. Erin, what's very encouraging is there's a group of people who have been amassing hordes and hordes of cash, billions and billions of dollars waiting for this moment. And what's encouraging about that is that there's a lot of money to buy up this pseudo distressed real estate. But more importantly, with that many bidders at the table, I suspect the discounts will be minimized quite notably. Hmm. What do you, now we have a question about people moving out of New York and whether you're seeing an outflow of people or an outflow in interest um, or people asking for referrals to Miami, um, maybe to LA or just even the Hamptons. Are you seeing kind of this interest flowing out? Can Absolutely. Go ahead, um, Lisa. So I'm going to answer it. I, I may have a different answer than you, John. You know, that happened after 9-11 that people said to me, oh, are you finding people moving out? Are people going to Westchester? Are they going to, you know, the country? Are they? And it was, again, I said before, it was few and far between. The private schools continue to be busy. Nothing really changed. Did you hear a few stories about people who left? Yes. Yeah, some people maybe who witnessed the horrors, who lived downtown and were never able to really live in New York again. You know, obviously very tragic events. Um, and if they saw them firsthand, but most people did not live New leave New York. Um, and then people asked me again if this was going to happen after um, the change in the salt deductions. 
and the change in the mansion tax and the transfer taxes. You know, people said, oh, you know, billionaires, millionaires, they're going to leave New York. They're going to go to Florida. Again, it's happened. I can't tell you that it's happened enough to really affect our real estate market. Um, and I don't think it's going to happen again. I, I still stand by the fact that people who have chosen to live in New York want to live in New York. And the reasons that they want to live in New York are not going to change. There are always going to be people who want to live in New York. I include myself as one of those people. I will tell you a big part of the reason why Eklund Gomes expanded across the country to California and down to Miami is because we were seeing a huge outflow and we were referring all of this business out, out, out. And, you know, we get such a small percentage on the referrals and it just got to be that big of a business that we decided to open up offices. When we did that, we just saw our business expand uh, greatly. We just, there's a lot of people that are leaving New York that are going down to Florida. There's people who go back and forth by coast or between uh, California and New York. But yes, I agree with you, Lisa. There are always going to be people who are moving into New York because they want a piece of it. They, you know, they want a part of that vibrant energy that you so eloquently described earlier on the call. There is something about New York City that you just cannot get anywhere in the world. So it's always going to be a market of people who want to live in New York City, for sure. Leslie, can you speak maybe to the second home market? And, you know, if you're seeing a big uptick, we've heard a lot about the Hamptons, for example. <laughs> Well, uh, Compass has offices in over 320 locations around the country, and what we are seeing is a very mixed bag. I would say, though, amongst the um, very wealthy, there are few, if any, who don't have a second home already. And I have spoken to several who are looking for a third and fourth home. My uh, feeling is that Westchester, New Jersey, and Connecticut, within about an hour of Manhattan, could become very hot items again. I also think what's exciting is that there's chatter in the federal government about repealing the salt limitation, which could be a big impact, especially because some of these locations have high um, real estate taxes. But I would imagine that the second home market is going to explode. And I, yeah, do I agree. Once a, a little bastion of safety, look at Lisa, John, and myself. Where are we yeah. right now? We're operating and functioning beautifully a little bored, desperate to get back to Manhattan's action because there is nothing like you. There's nothing like you. But people will want to have a second residence, whether it's in Aspen or Palm Springs or the Hamptons or, um, you know, by the lake in Dallas even. There are so many um, reasons now why having this nest somewhere and the sense of security is going to expand dramatically. Amongst the wealthy, I would say now, the focus on home and security is going to just blossom. And I do think this is going to be an exciting time over the next few years. Well, I do agree with Leonard on that. Well, okay, I, w I want to do one more speed round, so don't worry, you'll all have one more chance, but really quickly. Before we do, I just want to thank everyone who tuned in. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're doing TRD Talks three times a week. The next one's going to be Tuesday and then on Thursday. And tomorrow we're going to be talking to major landlords. Um, so you don't want to miss it. And once again, for everyone, um, if you can't be a sponsor, you can be a subscriber. So pay for the news that helps you get through your day. Um, but my final question for all of you, and this is a speed round, so you can't uh, give us your thoughts, but I'm sure you all saw the story about a co-op that asked a doctor who was here in New York to help out with emergency care to leave because they were afraid that they would um, infect the rest of the building. And I'm just curious, you know, we've heard so much about co-ops over the years and, and things, you know, just coming in a strange and unexpected way. I'm curious what you think this means for the asset class of the iconic New York City co-op. Well, Speed round. I'll, John. Start, I'll start because it's an awkward okay. topic. I'm good at awkward topics. Um, I think just like in the agent community, it takes one or two agents to make all the great agents of which the majority are look bad. I think it just takes one or two co-ops to behave really poorly to make all co-ops look bad. And it's unfortunate and unfair. And frankly, I see unbelievable opportunity in the co-op market moving forward. Number one, because it's much more affordable than condos in many regards. Number two, I think the sense of community you have in co-ops is extraordinary. And I also believe that the quality of some co-op buildings is magnificent. Great, Lisa, what do you think? 
Um, I agree with Leonard that I think, you know, one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch. Um, and I, I actually think it'll be a learning moment. I think that most co-ops will read about that and think to themselves, maybe we should do some self-reflection. Maybe we should make sure that we're always making best decisions, keeping everybody in mind, because obviously there was a way to handle this where um, they could have let this very generous doctor um, stay in the building and have kept everybody safe. He didn't come in with, you know, 15 people carrying the virus. Um, and so I, I think that it can be a learning moment, actually, for all of us, including co-ops. And I also believe that co-ops are still a really good value and a wonderful way to live in New York if you can, if you can pass their financial requirements. Right. John, what do you think? I, I, I myself hope that it is a learning moment for people who are running the co-ops in this city. I mean, when I heard that story, I found it so appalling because I can't help but think of all the images that I see on television with all of the people in apartment buildings that are singing songs and clapping hands for these people who are working so hard on the front lines. We don't give those people enough credit. And the fact that a doctor can come in and be rejected by a co-op, it's, it's, I have no words for that. It, it's appalling. And I hope that it becomes a teachable moment for those other people that are running co-ops across the city to take a good hard look at themselves and make sure that they don't do anything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I did, I did hear from a board president who was so angry they wanted to call so maybe, maybe. Um, That's great. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for being part of the TRD Talks. And we hope that people watching will tune in tomorrow at 5 o'clock.